Today we're going to focus on a topic around the data artist and I thought I would just do a quick poll. How many of you had ever heard of the term data artist before you got the invitation? Like, so a few, that's cool. Because one of the questions I think that, that many people would have, is this something new? Is this a role that we just made up to cause you to come to this meetup? Uh, is it something Matt created in his spare time? And uh, the short answer is no. It's, in fact, you could argue that this role has probably existed for several centuries. Uh, so I thought before I get into the meat of the presentation with Ryan, uh, we could kind of go back in time for a little bit, and maybe 150 years back to 1869, and um, meet maybe what was the first data artist, uh, or at least one of the first data artists, and that's Charles Menard. Uh, Charles uh, created a visualization that Stephen uh, Few, uh, Edward Tufte, is, is uh, referred to as one of the best examples of a statistical visualization. And this visualization captures Napoleon's march on Moscow. And that, for those who are familiar with the history, uh, Napoleon was busy building his empire again uh, and, and really wanted to take over the UK. Couldn't get Russia to go along with his plans, so decided he would try to compel them by going into Russia. Uh, what makes Charles's work tie into a data artist is that he takes on a lot of the steps that we're going to learn about in the presentation. He combines several sets of data. He didn't just look at uh, how many troops had passed during the march or the campaign, but he combined uh, troop volumes, direction, uh, which you capture with the color of the chart. And you see the volume of the troops as they're going through their journey, as they're traveling the distance uh, to Moscow. Uh, and unfortunately, you see the troop levels are going down by the thickness of the line going down. Uh, you see also how the troops are splitting off from each other. He combines six different sets of data into a single two-dimensional visualization. That's the type of thing a data artist is expected to do, is not just stop when they find an insight in data, but is really try to figure out how can I tell the whole story uh, and do it better than Olivier does when he just verbally describes it. I can look at that visualization and I can know a lot about what happened. I can start to tell Maybe this temperature chart that's overlaid on top may be correlated to how troops uh, died on the retreat. And you can see as the temperature goes down, the troop levels go down. Those are the types of insights that you as a data artist want to enable your consumer uh, to start to gain from looking at that visualization. So that's just a, an example from 150 years ago. Uh, if we rewind or if we fast forward, if Charles Minard uh, was in the audience today and he was describing how he would do this today, I would argue he would do very much the same steps, but he would have better tools to help him do it faster. So he would still have to go collect a bunch of data. In his time, it was reading text and looking at notes and, and manually tabulating. Today, he can connect the data sets, right? Uh, uh, and hopefully somebody's already created that data set. In fact, that data set uh, for that campaign exists uh, in, in open source form. Uh, and he might have decided to, to draw the exact same visualization because he could have used line charts or bar charts or standard visualization, but he, in fact, decided that the best way to tell this story was to invent a new visualization. So maybe what he would have done is arrived at the same decisions, but now with the use of computers and, and analytic tools, he might have added additional dimensions to it. He might have animated it. He might have added DVR controls so that you could simulate how the troops had moved over time, play, pause, rewind, you might have allowed people to filter out certain troops. You might have decided to overlay or not overlay the temperature. So it's just a quick glimpse into the, um, what he might have done, say, if he was here today. So these are all examples of how a data artist might have captured a historical event and, and had people learn from that history. But I think for most of us, it's about applying these skills so that we can help our organization, our companies, our nonprofits today make better decisions. So it's not just about historical data, but it's about marrying historical data with near real-time data or current information and, and lifting those insights to the right people in the organization. It's not just about Napoleon or the, you know, the CEO. It's about how do I empower my entire organization to make the right decisions. So hopefully what we'll find out today uh, is answer the question is what would Napoleon have done if he had had a data artist on his staff? He had had access to that modern data and he had it live maybe on an iPad in the field. Right? So my homework assignment for you guys by the end of the session is hopefully you guys have some creative ideas and whatever the wildest idea is or the coolest idea, um, 
I have a book that I brought that's a good visualization book, uh, Building Visualizations in JavaScript, and I'm, I'll give it away to whoever Matt decides was the best uh, answer, because uh, he wasn't paying attention. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about what we'll actually talk about in the presentation. So I'm going to go a little deeper into meeting this data artist role. What, what is it about? Where does it fit alongside other roles? Then we'll spend a day in the life of a data artist, kind of step by step, what do they do? And then finally, we'll talk about how can you unleash your own inner data artist, or how can you help your organization create some data artists in-house. Um, this is meant to be interactive, so there'll definitely be plenty of time for questions at the end. But if, if something really pops in your head and you want to ask right away, uh, feel free. If I don't know the answer, I'll point to Ryan. <laughs> and if he doesn't know the answer, he'll point to Matt. And then I think we're out. Uh, but uh, we'll talk about the data artists. So, so when I, I, I hear the term artist, partially because I was born in France and I moved to the US when I was younger, I, I learned early on that everybody thinks French people look like this, right? So that's the caricature of an artist. That's not who we're talking about. In fact, it's much more likely that that person will look like this. It's, a, it's someone who's familiar with their business, but also has knowledge about data and visualizations and storytelling. So um, I, I don't ride a bicycle with a baguette and a beret, uh, much to uh, Matt's uh, dismay. But there are a lot of roles, and you heard some of them earlier, and people are hiring data scientists, and, and uh, there are roles out there. So I thought we would call out the existing roles and where the data artist fits. Uh, on one end of the spectrum is the data scientist. That's the person uh, Matt referred to as a PhD, right? Somebody that really knows data. They, they can look at data sets, they can apply statistical methods, they can apply data mining algorithms, they can invent new algorithms, they can enrich that data. They love data. What they may not love or what they may not take is that information all the way to the end user or the person that needs to make the decision. They tend to live in the data. That's not always true. Some people have multiple roles, but for the most part, they tend to live there. That's what they've studied in school. That's where, uh, that's where they earn their keep. On the other end of the spectrum is what people might have called business analysts or BI analysts. These are people that, in fact, were responsible for creating that last mile, creating a report or a standard dashboard that an executive can use to make better decisions about the operations of their business. Historically, those types of folks leverage things like Excel and basic knowledge of relational databases to get at their data. And that was fine, say, up till about five years ago. That was where most of the data in an enterprise lived. But today, with the advance of new data sources, new data approaches, there's a widening gap between the ability for a business analyst or a BI analyst to, to leverage all that new information, because they frankly don't have the knowledge of how to deal with these new types of data sources. So, so we have a widening gap that we had been working through closing. We, we had done all this investment in doing things like self-service, where a BI analyst or a business user could connect to their data directly and they could do their own reports and that was all great. Uh, but now with, with the introduction of things like Hadoop and big data sources, it's no longer feasible for those people to connect directly and, and do these things. They need somebody to help them bridge the gap and that's where the data artist comes in. So a data artist needs to be familiar with data, not to the level of data scientist, but enough to know what a data scientist does and how to leverage what they can provide. And they need to know enough about visualization and insight discovery uh, to surface those to users. And the part that they do that the other two folks don't is figure out what is the best way to communicate that story to the broad audience in, in, in an organization, not just the executives or the department heads, but how can I let my entire organization leverage this information? How is the best way to tell the story? Uh, if you think of this as a relay race, they're running that last lap. So we've covered where the data artist fits in the realm of other roles. Uh, but I think to kind of help cement what they do, we should look at what they do in a typical day. So, that was a good idea. Yeah, thanks. Uh, since it has the term artist, I thought I would map it to a framework that is that of an artist, maybe a painter. Uh, I don't know if there's painters in the room uh, today. I'm not a painter, so I apologize if I don't represent you completely fairly. But um, at a high level, as a painter, I start off with my raw materials. I need my paints. 
Right? So I acquire my paints for a data artist that's acquiring their data. I'm not necessarily going to stop at the original colors that I got from paints. I have the ability to use a palette to mix those paints together, create new shades, new colors. For a data artist, it's about combining data sets. Just like Charles Minard combined multiple data sets to create a new data set that then fed his visualization. Having had all my paints and my palette ready to go, I'm now starting ready to paint. So for an artist, that would be their canvas. Uh, for a data artist, it's also a canvas, but it's a different type of canvas, and we'll go into more detail uh, in just a second. And once I've formulated what that story is and the story I want to tell, I need to share it. Otherwise, it's not going to add any value to my organization. Uh, for an artist, I would be bringing the art to a gallery. Uh, for a data artist, you also have that capability, but there are other models for bringing that gallery to other users. So let's, let's get our paints, which is the data. I mentioned that five years ago, from, for, well actually let's go back to Charles Minard. For Charles Minard, there's really only one, one kind of paint. It was text, books, reading, notes. Five to 10 years ago, there's really only two or three types of paints. Excel, relational databases. Today, you have a much broader variety of different types of paints. And it's really exciting in that now you can leverage these new types of data sources that you never had access to to try to find insights. So you have non-relational information, uh, non-structured data, you have search-based approaches, you have streaming information. All of that is now at your disposal as a data artist. The problem is that the skills that you had as an Excel user, as a SQL user, no longer apply because each of these things talk a slightly different language. So as a data artist, you need to be familiar with how to get that data and how to leverage it. Um, and, and a lot of people will focus on the word big out of big data, but to me, it's really the variety that's almost a bigger challenge. How do I leverage all of these different types of data sources and, and make sense out of them? But big is still there, right? So Ryan's gonna do a, a demonstration in just a few seconds about how, how big is big? And, and for me, I grew up in the database world. I, I dealt with large databases, but I never thought of these large databases being used for interactive analysis, live um, you know, exploration, which is what Ryan will show. Uh, so the thing to keep in mind is, is this ecosystem of data sources, it's not standing still. I, every week, it seems like there's a new project related to a new type of data source. Uh, and that's, that's good. and, and a challenge, right? How do, how do I make use of that data? So I'm going to let Ryan uh, come do a quick demo to help cement. For, for me, big data is a cool term, and, and I, I can imagine what it means. But until you actually see it in action, it, it's not uh, concrete for me. So hopefully, Ryan will be able to do that for you. Uh, as Olivier said, um, we've kind of moved into a new realm um, where, uh, where big data is no longer megabytes but um, it's terabytes, right, or gigabytes. And so uh, we're not dealing with like thousands or millions of rows, and this is relatively new. This is even in the last five or six or seven years because of faster internet connections, larger databases, uh, systems like Hadoop that allow you to, to string together a tremendous number of uh, resources into one integrated system. And so we're dealing with quantities of data that really just a few years ago were only like science fiction, right? And so I've been asked frequently by friends who kind of try to figure out what I do for a living, well, really, like, what's a billion rows of data? How do you do billions of rows of data? But just think for a second, with the traffic outside, how many data points does Google navigation collect from all of their users in a half hour in midtown Manhattan? I'll bet you it's on the, it's on the scale of billions of points of data. So um, the trick then is to take all this data and not make it so you can see what happened yesterday, but so you can see what's happening now or more or less now. And uh, one of the things that makes that possible and also to show the information not only timely but also quickly. So I worked at MicroStrategy before and we would have reports, like and you'd have to have this report scheduled and then you'd get the report overnight, right? Like this is just like five years ago. But you, who wants to wait overnight to see like where the traffic is, you know? that can work. So taking advantage of new systems we have, um, things like Cloudera and Paula and uh, Solar, Solar and Elasticsearch, and using their own like kind of in-system optimizations, we can use techniques like uh, microservices 
and data sharpening. You know, data sharpening is like kind of one of the coolest things. You know when you start with a video and you start to stream the video, it kind of starts off a little blurry and then it sharpens up, but you can kind of start watching at the start. Well, that's the kind of technology we're talking about that makes it so you can process huge numbers of, huge rows of data very quickly and And by serving up only the data that's needed, you can take billions of rows of data and very quickly, while you're sitting there, watch it, process what you need and show that to your users, um, which makes for a much more interactive experience, an enjoyable experience, um, where people can see very visually what you're trying to show them. Um, so these sorts of technologies have made it so that um, reports that would have taken hours to generate before now generate in just a few seconds. Today I've earned the role of PowerPoint guy and Ryan's earned the role of the cool demos. Um, but one of the things that Ryan touched on is not specific to Zoom data, but when you look at these things, uh, when you're dealing with a billion rows and you're, and you're deciding to combine multiple data sets, maybe you're combining one billion row data set here, another billion row data set, there's some laws of physics that come into play. And so it means that you have to start thinking differently. Uh, and and uh, in our case, we, we have this concept of micro queries or, or data sharpening where we push the work to the data source, but we ask for answers right away, that video streaming analogy. Uh, those are the types of strategies you have to employ that that weren't true when you were dealing with just relational databases. So these tools have to approach these things very differently than they have in the past, because uh, today it's, it's uh, terabytes, but tomorrow it'll be petabytes, and, and you just can't use old approaches to get that data in. So we, we had talked about, uh, as a painter, I would mix my paints together. As a data artist, I'm gonna mix these data sources together. Charles Minard, combined temp uh, temperature, historical temperature information, uh, true volume information, geographical location information, combine all those to, to tell his story. Uh, in, in the case of Zoom data, we call that fusion, uh, but really for most tools and approaches, they call those things data mashups. So the ability to combine these data sources together to then transform and enrich them to make a new set of colors that you can use to paint your picture. Uh, again, leverage. Uh, kind of building on what Ryan had touched on, it's not a matter of just getting a copy of all that data and bringing it in another place. You just can't do that. The, the, the physics don't allow that. The data is too big. You wouldn't want to do that. So you need new strategies to do these types of operations smartly. Uh, and that's, that's one of the things that, that you need to look at if you want to start uh, and empower your data artists to really work with these very large data sets. So I've got my paint. I'm now ready to go paint. And if I was a painter, I'd have my canvas, have my brush, and I'd start to lay down some strokes. I probably already have a picture in my mind as to what I'm going to paint. As a data artist, it's, it's sort of the reverse. I may have no idea what I'm going to paint when I first put my stroke down. What I'm trying to do is I'm exploring my data. So I want, to, I want a very forgiving canvas. I want to try something. I'm like, oh, uh, that's not good. Let me undo that. Uh, let me mix in some new color, some new data. No, that didn't add any value. So it's more, much more of an interactive experience uh, than a traditional canvas. Um, the, the thing that empowers that is some of the techniques that Ryan talked to. If you want an interactive experience where you can do and undo and try again, you can't be sitting there waiting for 24 hours to get that first answer. Uh, so those are the types of things that, that make that canvas uh, a big data canvas, I think, was uh, the original uh, title for, for one of the presentations. I mentioned that it should be collaborative. It, because it's a, it's a computer-based solution, it doesn't mean that there's a single painter working on that canvas. You can invite other people to come collaborate on the canvas with you. You can build off of the work that maybe Ryan started. I could start from Ryan's work and say, you know what, let me add this to it and send it back to Ryan to add more. Uh, and I can extend that canvas. So just like Charles Minard decided to kind of escape out of the bounds of standard visualizations, I should be able to add new visualizations to that canvas. And uh, the next demo Ryan will show uh, is, is in fact uh, when a pie chart just won't do. And, and I've worked with several people 
uh, and there's, uh, it's, uh, there's definitely some very biased views either way, but uh, for most people, pie charts probably should never do. So I'll let him, uh, again, take the show and try to set him up to do that demo. Can't do PowerPoint. There you go. Okay. Um, so one of the things I get to do with my job is just kind of play with data, and I like that a lot, you know? So I'm always looking for these different data sets that we can use for things like demonstrations. And um, I found this data set that was state-to-state -state migrations from the Census Bureau um, across years. So here we've got the, um, a table of people who have moved to Alabama from different states. Um, Alabama is ruled out because you can't move from Alabama to Alabama. That doesn't count as interstate migration. Um, and we could add rows and we could add columns, but ultimately we're looking at a lot of numbers and it's not easy to like spot a trend quickly. This is a nice table and it looks nice, but it's not nice data art. Um, but there are other ways you can present data other than just a, a table that work. Um, so here we have a pie chart that has done some drugs. And the great thing, of, that, that wasn't part of the presentation, I know, right? Yeah. I thought of that on the way up here. I didn't tell you that, though. So, so what we have still is the basics of a pie chart, right? Where the people leaving from Florida, like total migration, net migration, as a share of all the migration within the states, is still got its wedge, but we've added a dimension whereby the relationships between states and their migration is also called out. Now, this kind of looks like a hot mess. I mean, it's kind of cool. You might put it up on your wall as a poster of like kind of like one of those spin art things, you know? But there are things you can do that kind of start making it more useful. So one thing you can do, and I've been playing, I've been kind of building this visualization, so that's why I was a little worried about it, um, is you can mouse over to just highlight the ones you want to look at. I haven't implemented tooltips yet, but that's coming soon. Um, I've got a ticket for it and everything. Uh, and if it's a good transition to the, the next uh, portion, which is, so I, I've, I've created my art. I have a story to tell. I, I, I know that I want to tell the story. What's the best way to tell the story and reach the broadest set of users? Uh, I mentioned that one model is the gallery model. I've, I've created my dashboard. I've made it available, and I invite people. I send invitations or email. They, hey, come look at my dashboard. It's really nice. That's one model that's important. It's a traditional model. But more and more, it's about surfacing this story in the context of the applications the users use every day. So if you're a nurse working in a hospital unit, you might be using a patient management system on, on the floor, or maybe you have an iPad. It's very unlikely that you're going to need to shift out of that application to visit a BI tool to pull up some analytics about you know, the overall status of your, of your floor. Really what you want is want those analytics surface in the context of application. You might not even think of them as analytics. It's just part of the app. So uh, one of my coworkers kind of coined it as you can bring people to the gallery or you can bring the gallery to where the people are. Uh, and I think both are important. As a data artist, you have to decide what the right way to deliver that information is. Um, and so uh, I call that sharing. Uh, but sharing doesn't mean static dashboards. It means sharing an experience that allows the end user to also interact with it if it's the type of user who needs to do that. Um, so the final, I think it's the final demo, uh, will demonstrate this idea of um, surfacing analytics in the context of your own application as an alternative way to inviting people to come to the gallery to look at the dashboard you've created. So here we have an example of a purpose built app. And this was actually built by somebody, I mean, in addition to being an engineer, we would consider him a data artist. Because he's looked for, um, he's looked for like beautiful ways to make immediately obvious data that is interesting to the people that need the data. And that kind of reveals a story. Um, he's done this by having some JavaScript background and knowing the appropriate APIs. So he's been able to pull in data and actually use the data as kind of the controls even. So here we see what could just be a simple bar chart to show that Ford, I hope here, nobody here works for Ford, but Ford has a lot more complaints on their vehicles than say Jeep. And that's interesting enough. But he's actually made these into the menu options for drilling down. 
And that's kind of cool. And then you can look into individual models of Ford and see that that F-150 that looks so cool actually has a lot of complaints in a brand that has a lot of complaints. And you can click on that. And now these two options become the filters for this distribution chart, this bubble chart, to show you um, what kinds of complaints there have been, like crash-inducing or injury-inducing complaints. And you can pick it, zoom in, you can mouse over to get a tooltip, and he's put this all together with a few API libraries and, uh, and some elbow grease to make a really, really interesting way of looking at complicated data that makes sense. This is kind of a, an example of the sort of thing you can do when you have just two or three skills, really, that you can bring together um, and then put it into a place where people will use it, um, make it publicly available, or show off in whatever environment is appropriate for the data and the audience. Um, and I think it's PowerPoint time again. Sure. So what is, what is this future of this role? We talked about the fact that it's probably existed for a couple of centuries, so it's probably not going anywhere uh, fast. Uh, but what we do believe is that data artist thinking will become second nature. Right? It should become something that you, as you look at your data and you find an insight, you start to ask yourself, well, how should I tell this story? And I'm, uh, when, when I think about second nature, I always think about uh, one of my kids, my three-year-old, somehow has learned to go to the computer, log in, navigate to the Chrome browser, once on Chrome, go to pbskids.org, visit the Curious George website, find the video he wants to play, and play games. And my son doesn't know how to read, right? So I'm just always amazed by that. Uh, but really, he's learned from his siblings. But it's become second nature. If you give him a different device, an iPad or a Samsung tablet, within a few minutes, he knows how to use it. Right? So that's what we think will happen for data artists thinking. Uh, now, it's not going to happen overnight. I think within a few years, maybe five years, you should expect tools that you use to build in some smart recommendations, some of that data artist thinking built into the product. But again, you can't be Charles Minard if you constrain yourself to what the tool does for you all the time. You have to be able to escape. And so things like extensibility, custom visualizations, that's always going to be there. But you want tools to help you do at least the heavy lifting for the portion that's, that, that's repetitive. And that's what we think will happen in the next few years. Hopefully we'll be part of that. Um, and then within 10 years, uh, when it becomes second nature, you might look at your plate of food entirely differently. <laughs> and you might start to think about the information that's collected on your plate. I'm sure my kids don't look at that that way, but you look at distribution of the peas to carrots, right? You decide, how am I going to tell this story? Where did I hide the stuff my mom wanted me to eat and, and I uh, slid off the plate? Uh, but that's what we, we were hoping uh, will happen over the next 10 years is that this is not the skills that you have today where maybe you stop short of that. You kind of, you, you find the information and you call someone and say, it looks like we had $1,000 in sales. You now take it to the next step and figure out what's the best way to tell the story so the entire organization understands what's going on. All right, so that's 10 years from now, that's great, but we're here today. What, yeah. what can I do today? Well, uh, my understanding uh, is that the best way to learn how to paint or draw is to start off maybe with one color. So for a data artist, uh, that means take a data set that you like, you find interesting, or a data set you know very well, and just play with it, start exploring it, try different things, get comfortable with one data set it can be overwhelming to try to do too many things at the same time when you're first starting. So just start with some black and gray and, and try it. Um, one of our teammates, Matt's teammate, uh, did a lot of this artwork for the slides. So if you like it, it's all Burton's doing. If you don't like it, it's all Burton's doing. Uh, so we, we start with some colors. And then uh, what I would call painting by numbers, copy and plagiarize work that you find interesting from other people. Make a copy of that visualization or dashboard, right? Ryan uh, demonstrated some of that, not to pick on him, uh, but he's right here. Uh, once you learn how that's done, then you can escape out of the painting by numbers and you can paint your own pictures and they might start to look like this. All right, so we've, now we feel comfortable. We know how to explore. We've tried it with a few data sets. We, we know how other people do it. Now you can play, right? Now you start to add more colors, add more data sets. And the vast majority of the time, it won't add any value whatsoever. Like you'll add temperature and nothing will pop. Like, and that's okay, you're exploring. 
but sometimes it will pop and that's the part. That's why you need that very interactive canvas to let you try these things very quickly. Um, and finally, um, we touched on this a few times, but if your canvas doesn't allow you to tell the story that you want to tell, don't constrain yourself, expand it. Add new visualizations, add new delivery mechanisms. It doesn't have to be a dashboard, it can be a custom application or a surface, an analytic surface in your own application. And like with most things, uh, Malcolm Gladwell in, in his outlier book mentioned that it takes 10,000 hours to become an expert on anything. So it's all about practice. So just keep practicing. And again, a lot of times it'll be frustrating because you won't get any insight that pop. But once you do, it's pretty valuable. In fact, you might think about how Napoleon, had he had a data artist on staff and he had live and historical information about Russian war tactics and temperature and the almanac, and he could have added all that and a data artist could have put it together for him to interact with, he might have made very different decisions. Uh, he might have approached this differently. Those are the types of what if things that you want to do as a data artist uh, and to empower, in this case, Napoleon, but really in your organization, whether it's a nonprofit or for-profit company, to make these types of decisions uh, in a smarter way. Um, so I want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy days to come uh, listen to us. Uh, a couple of Virginia folks come here and, and tell you about data artists. Um, these are some books that I, uh, I particularly liked. One of them is the one that, that we can give away tonight, uh, which is the data visualization with JavaScript uh, so that you can be just like Ryan uh, and create visualizations. But I will say, just in case you're planning to go order it on Amazon, the Show Me the Numbers book is not a book you want to take on a plane. It's relatively heavy and big, and it's more of a coffee table book, but it's really nice. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. Thank you guys for coming out all the way from Virginia. Otherwise, <laughs> hope to see you again next month. Thank you very much for coming out.